Good morning, everyone, and welcome to TLC. It's a pleasure to be able to worship with you this morning. And why don't we start our worship with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we need you. Father, we love you and we look to you during this time. Um, Lord, we know that uh, only you have the power to move people and move hearts and to heal. And Lord, we pray for um, just continual protection um, against the COVID and um, just against injustice. And we pray for those who are affected, Lord, that you would bring um, your healing and your power and your restoration to people's lives. Lord, we lift up this worship to you, and may you be pleased with our hearts and remove anything that is not of you. In Jesus' name, amen.
comes from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and verses 23 to 25. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples have also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind the Jews used for ceremonial washing. Each held from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice of wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first, was the first of the signs through, through which he revealed his glory, and the disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. With, with his mother and brothers and his di disciples, they stayed there for a few days. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed his name. But Jesus did not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Good morning, brothers and sisters uh, of TLC and everyone who is joining our worship through watching the worship video. Um, it's been a while, uh, more than six months since we are not meeting face to face. Um, although it's not ideal, but I still, I'm still very grateful that we can uh, get it together over the internet and still worship in spirit and truth. And then for that, I want to Give my thanks to God and also many volunteers who come here every week. Uh, they came here early to practice and to set up everything. Uh, it is a, quite a, a fellowship here. And, and so if you, um, I, I would like to invite you, brother and sister, just come up once in a while. Let me know ahead of time so we can do all the worship together. And I also want to thank our brother and sister who sacrificed their time. So every Sunday at 10 a.m., and we can have this high-quality worship video there to serve. Uh, we are doing better and better, uh, and that is the effort for many brothers and sisters. And in particular, I want to thank Eric, who brought in uh, the, the, the system, brought in uh, his time. Uh, and then now we, we have uh, this uh, open broadcast system. Uh, a quite a professional software that can allow us eventually that we can even do live streaming. For that, we give all the glory to our Lord. Yeah, and then let's uh, give to the Lord with our prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that at this difficult time, our worship is not hindered. We can still get it together in one spirit to worship you. Lord, I want to thank you. Lord, may you bless those who sacrifice their time to serve everyone. That we, 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 most of us who are served don't get to see them, but they are here every week and different people, different function every Sunday. They, every Saturday came here for recording so on Sunday we can have a worship video. Lord, you know who they are. May you bless them. Constantly remind them the meaning of their work and so that they can be encouraged and be edified, and then that they will serve you and with a great passion and energy. Lord, I pray that this online worship can continue to serve our brothers and sisters, to inspire them, to bring them into a unified heart, to worship you, to give you the praise, to give thanks to our Savior who gave us eternal life. So I also pray for our weekly meetings, uh, Sunday schools, work fellowship meetings, and Bible teaching, every one of them, Lord, may you bless them. Continually add to use them to bless our brothers and sisters 
so that we continue to learn your word. And then that despite that we don't meet face to face, that I, we can continue our spiritual growth. Lord, I pray for your mercy over the uh, um, a pandemic situation. Lord, I pray that the effective vaccine can, be, can come out soon. I pray that the, the suffering and can be reduced. I pray for people to soften the heart. And therefore, more and more people will come and call on the name of Jesus Christ with repentant heart. Lord, we know that you are still in control. We pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray for the November election. I pray for people after your own heart can be elected to serve the country, to bring the country to fight for the disease and then to remove all of these social upheaval, these conflicts between people of uh, different colors. Lord, I pray that we will have a country and that is following your word to do justice and then to do mercy and then to walk humbly with our Lord God. Also pray for your mercy over the natural disaster, O oh Lord. The wildfire all over the places and then the, the hurricane, the flooded situation. Lord, I pray for your mercy. May you hear our prayers and heal our land. And I pray that the more and the more people will come before, constantly come before you through prayers and lift up their difficulty in your hand. And may you comfort them, each one of them. And now I pray that you will put the good hard soil, or fertilize the hard soil in our heart as we are ready to listen to your word. And may you, the Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may your word, your words transforming power be at work in each one of our heart. And I pray all of these in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Have you seen a miracle that occurred on other people's lives or experienced one yourself? When something occurred that is uh, extraordinary, that's beyond our comprehension or expectation, we said it is a miracle. And any effect uh, or extraordinary event in our physical world, and that surpasses all human known power, and then we say that it is a word of God, right? We, we say it is a miracle. I have read about many stories about, mir about miracles, and then I have witnessed one myself. Some 30 years ago, a good friend of mine was diagnosed with leukemia, uh, one of the worst kind. The doctor wasn't quite sure if he could survive the next day. However, through God's grace and many prayers, today he is still well and serving the Lord. Some of you may ask, is it a miracle possible? The Bible is full of miracles. Perhaps you have no problem when you hear, when you read that Jonah swat, swallow a fish. Uh, well, eating sashimi will do. But actually, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. And after three days, he still survived. That was a miracle. The greatest miracle recorded in the Bible is Jesus' birth, death, resurrection, and ascension. Now, you should not have any problem believing in any miracle in the Bible if you believe Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. If you believe that everything is down here, right? When God created the heavens and earth, not only did he create the materials, he also mandated how the material should act and interact. And we are so used to see the results of God's creation. We, we see that every day 
And we're so used to it, we call them the regulars. And then the law that govern the regulars, we call them the laws of the nature. Obviously, because God is the creator of the regulars and the, the law of the nature, then he is not bound by his own creation. And in, his, in, in human history, God does involve with the human history. And sometimes he interferes with the natural law to achieve his purpose. And when that happens, it is a miracle. And then is a miracle required for someone to get to know God and have a personal relationship with him? You probably have heard people, some people say that if God shows me a miracle and I'll believe him. Today's scripture recorded the first miracle that Jesus did in his ministry on earth. Apostle John called it a sign. Now, a sign in the original Greek means that a distinguishing mark, a, a token, or, 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 um, uh, or signal. Uh, in like a today's traffic signal, uh, it tells you something, right? It, it means something. And John said that the purpose of the sign is to make visible the character and power of God. And then that he is actively working in a unique way in Jesus Christ. And John said that the purpose of these signs is to reveal Christ's glory. The people who saw the miracle performed by Jesus understand the meaning of these signs? Did they believe in him after he performed miracles? Interesting question, right? Let's look for the answer from today's story. According to the passage, Jesus' first miracle or sign on earth was performed in a wedding. In a wedding. A marriage is instituted by God, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. One man, one woman. Two become one, different, but in unity. Raise the children in a loving relationship, and then they work together to sustain the home. Now, marriage, this is a truest, best, and then the most beautiful relationship on earth. It is a gift from God. Any individual or society who try to alter it, try to contradict God's design or to destroy the marriage will suffer loss, emptiness, and hurt. When the Lord Jesus came to earth, he participated in a wedding himself. Now, this is God's affirmation of a public ceremony. Do you remember your own wedding? Or perhaps you have started sketching one for one of your own wedding because what, what, sketching one for yourself uh, because our congregation is for young people. And I have officiated a few. It is a joyful time in the presence of God and in the family and some friends. The groom and the bride exchange vows, promise to take care of each other until death do them part. And all the invited guests are there as the witness of that change of exchange of a vow and then promise to help them to keep the vow. That's the meaning of the public wedding ceremony. And now let's take a look at the wedding in Cana. Now Cana was a small, was a small village nine miles north of Nazareth. And we know that Jesus had to live in Nazareth for 30 years. Cana was not far away. And then the wedding was a big thing for the, for the village. Probably close friends and relatives were invited. And Jesus and his friend were invited. And he's was somehow related to the wedding family. And Jesus' mother Mary was there too. He might have helped organize, prepare for the wedding feast. And that is why when they ran out of wine, Mary was trying to help. Now in the first century, the wedding 
in Palestine was a major event. Before the wedding day, the bride and the groom have already engaged. And during that engagement period, the future groom of uh, the future groom has to prepare a place for the newlyweds to live. He had to prepare for the entire wedding and everything that needed for the wedding feast. And the entire wedding expenses is paid by the groom side. It was nice to have to have son at that time, but it's different from our culture today. Uh, oh no, it's not, no, 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 totally opposite. You know, if you're a son, they're gonna pay for everything. <laughs> and like, not like our culture today, uh, the, the, the bride's side will pay for uh, the wedding. The wedding cere celebration usually lasts for about seven days, and then the wedding feast will go, will continue throughout the entire celebration period. Family, family and friends, they were invited to stay there and then have a good time. The wine is, was essential for the party because it was a symbol of, of joy. And then the wine that is recorded in John chapter 2 is a fermented drink. It's not just a juice. Yeah. At Jesus' time, they, don't have, they didn't have a refrigerator. It is very hard to keep the water safe. So alcohol becomes a common drink. And in order to avoid the drunkenness and crying, the Jewish people usually diluted the wine with water uh, at the 1 to 3 or 1 to 10 ratio. It was very embarrassing if the wine ran out before the banquet was over. It could imply something like this. It could imply that the groom lacked the, cap the capability to, to plan. Or, 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 or even lack of capability to make a living uh, or to take care of the bride. And how could the father of the bride marry the, his daughter to a man like this? So it was a serious problem. And then the groom's family must take the full responsibility. Mary then told Jesus, they had no wine. It was obviously that, uh, that she turned to Jesus for the solution. And verse 11 uh, of the chapter that we just read, it tells us that turning water into wine was Jesus' first miracle. So it is unlikely that Mary was expecting Jesus to perform, perform a miracle or something. And at that time, we believe that Joseph will probably die already. Uh, Joseph will probably die very young. And naturally, Mary turned to his, her eldest son for, uh, for the solution, like other widows would do. And moreover, for the past 30 years, Jesus had been a perfect eldest son. And then he handled all the family difficulties. Facing Mary's request, Jesus replied, Woman, why do you involve me? Now, woman, now you don't want to answer your mother this way. Woman, in original Greek, gune, however, is by no means anything that is disrespectful. Remember on the cross? When Jesus told Apostle John to take care of his mother, he also used this word to address Mary. As a matter of fact, in the, in the Greek context, culture, this term is not intimate, but it is a formal or polite way uh, uh, to, to address, like a ma'am. It all depends on how the, the, the use, uh, people, uh, the speaker use it. Now, faced with Mary's request, Jesus wanted to state an important fact. Now, although he was the eldest son of Mary, he was more so the son of God, who became flesh and came to the world for the salvation of humanity. For the past 30 years, he had been taking good care of his parents, being obedient to his parents, and now, 
his public ministry had begun. He is going to the cross and die on the cross for our salvation. And then he must be submissive to this mission. He must be loyal to the Heavenly Father. So Jesus very politely drew a line to the requests of people. Jesus was basically saying to Mary, nothing implied, nothing disrespectful. Jesus was saying that I have to do whatever Heavenly Father wants me to do, and then that's what I do only. And then Jesus explained about his, his, his answer. He said, he said, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Now, in the, in, in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses this word many, many times. Hour. I want to bring your attention to John chapter 12, verse 23. Before that, when Jesus, when John used the word hour, he always pointed to the future. But read uh, John chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus came to the world to bear the punishment of sins for everyone. His hour referred to the time when he now would die on the cross and then resurrect on the third day. You know, all the revelations of the Old Testament about festival, about custom, about sacrifice, about all the rituals, all point to this hour. And all will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I, I missed one slide, but that's okay. On June 6, 1944, more than 160,000 Allied forces, Allied, Allied troops landed on the beaches of Normandy, France to begin this operation that would liberate Western Europe from the control of Nazi Germany. And that event, that event is remembered as D-Day. D-Day. It simply signifies the day and that the invasion will be launched and it puts all the timetables into play. And the term H, hour, works similarly with H, referring to the time when the Allied troops will hit the, the beach. And that was 6.30 a.m. to be exact. Everything has to be orchestrated and then with a, a perfect timing. And now that the hour Jesus was referring to, Jesus said, also allow us to understand that all things under human history, particularly this most important one event in human history that Jesus died on the cross and resurrected, they are all under God's plan. The very hour. It is God's hour. It is under God's timetable. Then the mother of Jesus asked the servant to do whatever Jesus asked them to do. She was quite persistent. However, this was also an evidence that she was not offended at all. Um, Although Jesus was, has politely drawn a line and remind her about his, un, his identity and mission, Mary was persistent and faithful. She didn't know what Jesus was about to do, but he just trust, lift up this dilemma into Jesus' hand as a believer. The six water jars were made of stone, and then Together, six of them, they can hold about 120 to 180 gall gallons of water. Now, no party can consume so much wine. What are they for? From Mark chapter 7, verses 3 to 4, we learn about the ceremonial washing of the Jews. Now, when they come off on the outside, they're afraid that they might be... Uh, and clean, contaminated by things that they touch. So at this like a water ceremony, water pour on the hand, and then through the finger, and then and then and then that water that water drift through their fingers. They have this washing ceremony, and then those 
uh, water jars contain water for that purpose. Jesus told a servant to fill up the jar with water. And John particularly told us, the servant filled up pure water up to the brim. Why pay attention to these details? Now John mentioned that for a purpose. The water was filled all the way to the brim just to remind you that nothing can be added further. They are the order space has been used to contain the water. And then now Jesus turned the fresh water into a choice wine. He asked uh, the servant to take some of this freshly made choice wine to the master of a banquet. 180 gallon, the sheer, the sheer quantity of the water turned into wine, it becomes a symbolic of this lavish provision in the new age that God will abundantly provide. And then that's what, that's the, the, the provision brought by Jesus Christ. Jesus had brought also the joy to the wedding. Now in the wedding, the, the groom was supposed to be the main character of the celebration, wasn't he? However, he did not show up until verse 9. He becomes a secondary in this wedding. In essence, right? Jesus solved the dilemma of the wedding. He provided the wine needed. And then the banquet manager gave the praise to the bridegroom for the quality of the wine. In essence, Jesus satisfied the role of the bridegroom and then the banquet manager. The author of the Gospel of John reminds the readers that Jesus was the true center figure of this wedding feast. My eldest daughter Joanne got married in November, last November, uh, to Joseph. Now during the wedding preparation, I was honored to be consulted with some of the wedding details. <clears throat> And I told Joanne and Joseph, as long as your wedding is Christ-centered, I will be happy. In our, in our congregation, now we have so many unmarried boys and girls, right? And then when you are planning your wedding, or perhaps you, when you are sketching one, make sure you invite Jesus. Make sure that Jesus is the center of your wedding. And make sure he is the center of your marriage relationship. Now in the Gospel of John, Apostle John selectively chose eight miracles that Jesus did, or eight signs Jesus did, and he recorded in the book. He called them signs, right? Semeon. And then reminds the readers, the purpose of recording these signs, that you may believe that Jesus is truly the Messiah. The, the, the signs serve the purpose that Jesus is truly the mighty Son of God. And by believing Him, you may have eternal life. And that's the purpose of the Gospel of John. However, the people believe in Him after seeing all these eight miracles. I want you to point your attention to verse 11 of chapter 2. It says, What Jesus did in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. His disciples, at that time, there were five of them Andrew, Peter, Philip, Nathaniel, and likely John, the author of the gospel. Now there, his disciple believed in one the sign was pointing to. You see, they are not just believing in the sign itself. They believe in a person that is behind the sign, and that is Jesus Christ. So they believe in him. However, verses 23 and 24, and later during the Passover festival, many people saw the miraculous sign Jesus did. Jesus performed a lot more miracles. And during the festivals, and 
Bible said that they believe in his name. However, sadly, their faith was spurious. And Jesus didn't knew it. Jesus knew what's in people's heart. And therefore, he did not entrust himself uh, to these spurious converts. The Jews who came to Jerusalem for Passover did not realize that the meaning of a Passover actually is pointing to Jesus, the Messiah. And therefore, now the long way did the Savior has come, and yet they failed to recognize him. The Messiah came not, not only with perfect teaching, he also came with the mighty works of God. He performed many, many miracles. But the, the glory of Jesus was not visible to many people at a time. Although the Jewish people are among all the people, all the nations who have witnessed the most miracles in human history, yet today, so many are still rejecting Jesus. They see the miracles, but they did not see Jesus himself. They did not understand the meaning. There is no personal relationship as a result of witnessing miracles because you establish your faith based on just witnessing miracles is shallow. It won't result in personal relationship. Only when you understand what the, the, the miracles, what the, the signs are pointing to and the, the person behind them who is performing the miracles, then you can have the relationship with him. And to those who have not yet even seen the miracles and still believe Jesus promised that they will have blessings. And then before we go, I have three applications for you. Now I think that sooner or later people are going to ask me, is it okay for Christians to drink wine? What do you think? I might as well just answer it now. Now, the Bible does not say bad things about wine. And in fact, it commends wine once for medical reason, as, as Apostle Paul advised Timothy. However, listen carefully. The Bible warns against drunkenness all over the places. Throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible warns against drunkenness. Why? Because alcohol is dangerous. Alcohol is dangerous. It can control your brain. You all know when people have too much wine, they do stupid things, right? They speak, they speak stupid things and they, they, they behave foolishly. So why do you want to walk in this gray area? You know, people like to ask that, how can I get, get away with it and still be safe? People try to, uh, they try to uh, wait in the, the, uh, the gray area and they try and, and not to cause problems, try to be safe. But, but why, as a Christian, why do we want to walk in the gray area? Listen to the two answers the Bible has for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, I have a right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Apostle Paul said, I, can, I have a right, I have freedom to do everything, but I don't want to be controlled by anything. I don't want to be controlled by it. When you drink too much wine, you will be under its control. And then why do you want to do anything that has the danger of controlling you? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, it says that I have a right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Now, as a Christian, we need to be very, very careful how people think when they are watching our life. What if the people who are watching you drink is one out of 14.4 million adults who are struggling with alcohol use disorder? When one of these people are seeing you drink as a Christian, is, is, it, uh, give them, is it giving them the permission to do it as well? 
something for you to think about it. Application number two, are you one of those who said that if God shows me a miracle, I will believe? In the Bible, in the human, source, human history, have shown us so many people who saw the miraculous display of God's work, yet failed to see the God behind all these works. You see, the true problem is not lack of miracles or lack of evidences. It is the heart. The problem is the heart. You see, your arrogance makes you think that the creator of the universe, of the heavens and earth, owes you a miracle in order to convince you about his existence. No, God does not owe you. The greatest miracle after Jesus Christ's life, death and resurrection, is the change of the life of the sinners. The change of the life of sinners that requires the greatest power on earth. And that is the greatest miracle as well. And it still occurs every day. It still occurs every day. And then many people can give you the testimony that they have, they have changed the life because of the power of the mighty God. You don't need God to perform any more miracle to convince you. If the guy is speaking to you today, would you set aside this demand and just come before him with humanity and faith? Application number three. Every time when we are desperate, we beg God for miracles, right? It could happen when your work, when your family finance, when your relationship, your school works, or even ministry hits the dead end. And author Mark Twain said that you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. You see, when we are desperate, all we see is those problems. But how you see life can influence your next step, even your destiny. And so next time when you are in desperate situation, would you shift your focus from all of these challenges, difficulties, and your limitation, and shift them to Jesus Christ alone? Jesus Christ alone. Like Mary. She had no idea what Jesus would do. You know, he, prior to that, he had never performed a miracle before. But he, she just brought the problem to Jesus as a believer. She was so persistent and she was so faithful. And therefore, listen to what Christ is speaking to you in your situation. In your desperate situation, you know, disappear. disappear. Keep your eyes simply on Him. And when you do that, you don't see the obstacles anymore. You see only Jesus Christ, the one who can make it your way clear. It will allow you, by doing that, allow you, allow you to get to know Him in a more intimate way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, through the story, we know who your son Jesus Christ is. He's the Messiah sent by you. And he brings this lavish provision at the new age. Mostly, he brings the abundant life. The first miracle was just a private one. <clears throat> it brought joy. It allowed people, his disciples to get to know him, to believe in him. And they were more and more following it. And then the greatest one is Jesus. Life, death, and resurrection and ascension. Thank you for allowing us to read it. Lord, I pray that each one of us who heard your word, whether we have been the one who demands the miraculous sign in order to believe in you, Lord, I pray that through this message, that they will change their mind. They don't need a miracle. They need a change of life. Work in them. Speak to them so that they can come before you with a humble heart 
and call on the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for Christians, especially during this pandemic situation. There will be time of desperation. And when that happens, they don't need a miracle. They just need a relationship with Jesus Christ. They just need, we just need to focus our eyes on Jesus Christ and listen to Him and then wait on Him and dip the, all the difficulty in, your hand, in His hand and waiting for Him to clear the way. Thank you for this wonderful message. And I pray that brother and sister will contemplate and in order to establish a closer relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. I pray all of these in Jesus' name. Amen. Although we cannot meet face to face, uh, as a church, we continue to follow the command of our Lord Jesus Christ to observe the Lord's table. And then the Bible warns against participating the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. And then the Bible wants us to examine ourselves, to prepare our heart before we participate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, we come before the Lord's table to commemorate the sacrifices that your son Jesus Christ did for us. We come with a grateful heart. We also come with a repentant heart. We want to ask for your forgiveness. Forgive our sins that we have sinned against you. We have sinned against our brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask that you use this moment to remind us that everything that we have done and said, or everything that we have been contemplating of doing and saying, if there's anything that is not pleasant to you, we ask for the forgiveness. We ask the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us so that we can observe the Holy Communion in a worthy manner. And I pray all of these in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, gave the things, and he broke it, said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, and says, this is the new covenant in my blood, in my blood, shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When you eat the bread and then drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then now as we are passing the elements at the home, whether you have prepared or not, it's okay. I want you to re-exempt your heart and participate with us by examining your heart and ask for forgiveness and then give thanks to the Lord. Each one of us, let's spend a few minutes to contemplate on ourselves.
brothers and sisters, the bread, the, this bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for us. Let's partake together with thanksgiving. Our brothers and sisters, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed for us. Let's partake with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your grace, which we will perpetually be grateful. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. And may our life be constantly reminded of the big sacrifice that Jesus died for us. And so that we may live a life that's worthy of your salvation. Now as you send us out to our missions field, be it our family or our workplace, or in our social circle. And may we be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And that we can proclaim this wonderful name of our Lord Savior. And that through believing Him, that people may have eternal life. So help us. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our worship with tithes and offerings, and I'm going to pray for our offering. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for the abundant provisions for our church through the many cheerful givers. Lord, we ask for your wisdom on how to use your resources. In Jesus' name, amen. Some announcements this morning. Um, Pastor Albert and Aichu will continue morning prayers every week from Monday to Friday at 8 a.m. in Mandarin and Taiwanese through Zoom. So you're welcome to join their morning devotion together. If you would have anything that you would like Pastor Albert to be praying for you, please contact him. We have events uh, throughout the week. So um, right after service, we have Sunday school classes. And for um, high schoolers and above, um, they're going over Grasping God's Word, um, Chapter 4, How to Read the Book by Paragraphs. And then for middle school, we are covering a series of um, applic applicable topics. Um, the first week we did social media, and then we did uh, anxiety, and then today we're going to cover friendship. So class will start at 1120. And then Thursdays, we have Mana Fellowship. That's for everybody, college and above. At 7 o'clock, they're going over slaying the giants in your life. And this week is chapter 4, fighting guilt. And then youth group is Fridays at, at 7.30. Youth group is for middle schoolers to high schoolers. And we're going to close our service today with a benediction from Pastor Albert. Now, if you are able, I'd like to invite you to stand wherever you are and receive a benediction. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love from Heavenly Father, and the communion from the Holy Spirit be with you all, from now on until eternity. Amen. View now to access today's Sunday service. Here are the services that you might have missed. Yeah.
Oh.